are right in the heart of learning how to visualize geographic data. And we've been playing around with some ideas about maps. And so on today's episode of the One Chart at a Time video series, Kenneth Field, who is the author of the great book Cartography, comes by to talk about a class of maps called cartograms. Because one of the challenges about creating data-driven maps is the trade-off between maps that are familiar to people, so when we look at them, we immediately know where we are located in the data, and maps that do a, perhaps a better job of accurately representing the data. Because there are geographies, states, countries, counties, uh, that may distort our perception of the data just because of their size, which may not correspond to the data value. So this class of maps may not be as familiar to you when you initially see it, but it may in fact do a better job of actually plotting the data. So Ken is gonna run through a class of cartograms to show you some alternatives to the standard data-driven map. Thanks, John, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute to one chart at a time. Uh, I'm gonna talk us through the population density equalizing cartogram, uh, which is a mouthful. Um, it's also a particular type of thematic map, which I happen to quite like. Um, it might sound paradoxical, but geography can get in the way of making a good thematic map. Um, largely because administrative boundaries vary in size, as do population densities within the areas they represent. Now, this immediately compromises the cognitive rationale for designing most thematic maps, which is really to provide the reader with a map from which comparisons between areas are clear and discernible. For instance, on a geographical map, at the very least, you have to ma manipulate data to take account of the inherent differences in the size of each area. Now, this might be done through normalizing absolute values for a choropleth map to report them as a rate or a percentage, say, or by choosing a different map type altogether that supports the mapping of totals, such as a proportional symbol map. But instead of processing the data to retain the geography, an alternative is to retain the absolute data values, but instead modify the geography. So consider the United States electoral system in which states with larger populations get more electoral college votes and where colour is often simply used to show the victorious party at state or county level. Yet the more populous states are not necessarily the same as the largest states in terms of land area and so a map that shows the predominant result as either red or blue in the geographical sense inevitably skews our perception of the result. Montana is huge but only has three electoral college votes. For many election cycles, it's always returned Republican, and so it adds a lot of red to the map compared to, say, Washington, D.C., which is imperceptibly small on a national map. It also has three electoral college votes, but you'd hardly see the blue that it adds to the map. So what we end up with, although accurate, is a somewhat misleading map because many densely populated states are relatively small and vice versa. So for my book called Thematic Mapping, I made 101 maps, graphs and charts of the 2016 presidential election to explore the differences in design and interpretation of the data. Here, for instance, is a county level map of the results, which shows the issue of land area overemphasizing sparsely populated areas compared with densely populated areas. And even though the data is normalized and we're looking at the percentage margin of victory and the map isn't incorrect, it is a little bit deceitful. People are simply not that good at seeing through the mediated view of the data that the map technique delivers. And while it's possible to accommodate such issues using different design approaches for symbology, the alternative is to morph the geography itself. And this is the basis for a cartogram. It's a diagrammatic form of map that distorts the geography to overcome some of the problems of heterogeneous reality. Contiguous cartograms maintain connectivity between adjacent geographical areas but have a tendency to dramatically distort shape. Perhaps the most widely known is the Gassner Newman cartogram, otherwise known as a population density equalizing cartogram. Now, it does an excellent job of retaining some character of the general shape of individual areas. Changing the shape of the map has consequences as the map attempts to balance statistical accuracy, geographical accuracy, and topological accu accuracy. The degree of distortion often renders the map difficult to interpret due to the abandonment of familiarity. And if your data has large outliers, the map will be quite violently skewed out of shape. Of course, they are attention grabbing, and if used in a web map, data could still be retrieved through a hover or a pop-up or some sort of click event which can counter the visual jarring. Back to US electoral geography, and here's a population density equalizing cartogram of the 2016 presidential election by county. 
It shows the margin of victory of the same diverging hue color scheme as we saw before with the geographical map. The darker the red, the more Republican. The darker the blue, the more Democrat. It's exactly the same map I showed a moment ago, but with geographical areas being distorted by the size of the population of each county. And the impacts are quite profound. The two seaboards with large cities that voted Democrat are now more easily seen. The narrow squeeze down the Rocky Mountain range is evident, as is the compression of many of the north and northwestern sparsely populated states. Washington DC is now visible and is not far off the size of South Dakota on this map. And to counter the lack of familiarity, the map has city labels added so people can find places by name. State boundaries are also added to help people see the collection of counties that make up each state. It's often useful when making maps that have a higher cognitive load to include these kind of design elements that help lower that load and make the map reading task easier. Of course, familiarity does help, and this is still recognisable as the United States. But what of less familiar places? If you rotated this map 90 degrees clockwise, it actually takes on the appearance of a distorted United Kingdom. Also, notice there's no scale bar, because scale has been shot to bits across this type of map. So these types of maps often result in a quite visceral reaction, which can be both beneficial or a drawback. People often either like them because of the way in which they efficiently deal with the graphical problem of mapping data inside in unequal geographical containers, and they are impactful at first glance, inviting people to question what exactly it is that they're seeing. But some people tend to really dislike them because of the way in which they do distort otherwise recognisable shapes. The more familiar the audience is with the geography being mapped, the less the cognitive load will be. In an interactive sense, providing some way to see a ge geographical map alongside via a switch or morphed between the two can overcome some of the limitations. So I hope this short discussion of the population density equalizing cartogram offers some insights into its effectiveness or otherwise. John, back over to you. And thanks to Ken for that great review of cartograms what they look like, how they are used, and how they can sort of overcome some of these data distortions that are caused by these changes in these different geographies of the states and countries and other geographic units that we are plotting on our maps. So come back tomorrow for another episode of the One Chart at a Time video series where we'll be talking about more ways to plot your geographic data. Thanks for tuning in.